channel for introduced for, for about seven years. <laughs> um, I'm introducing it because Grant's the new seminar organizer and he felt embarrassed to introduce himself. <laughs> Which he's not normally shy to. <laughs> <laughs> for those who know. For that, Grant did a um, mining and uh, mineral processing degree at UQ. Came to do a PhD in something completely different. And he's told me to start to do something completely different as like the academic challenge and not something that would turn down define his career by what he happened to have done in his PhD, which I think for many of you would have found was quite almost arbitrary, it was what was offered. And uh, so he chose to do something quite esoteric, which it was, and it was fun. Right? <laughs> um, D being D spotted Grant, and I had spotted him, but not that, not as clearly as D had, and she said, we've got to keep this guy. And I said, right, we'll, we'll do that together. But actually, Grant ended up working for me because I had the money. So that was quite straightforward. And he does talk in those lessons. But Grant's made himself quite a, quite a stamp or mark in, in the, the JK Centre in the four years as well. Yeah. Four years now. And since his PhD. Uh, he's not convinced anyone's read his PhD other than the examiner and Tim. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the supervisor. <laughs> We have Peter Holton. Um, but the work he's done some, since there is making a mark worldwide. There's no doubt about it. Um, I'll claim some glory for that because I've, I've set out a system in CSRP to quantify the split of energy. And there have not really been any takers. And God, jump up and down with his hand in the air as he does. I'll do it, I'll do that. And he's done a magnificent job. I've gone way beyond my expectation. As he has with many other things. There's multi skills, um, enjoys talking, highly social, a good glue in the centre. So, an interesting person to have around, and I think suited to a broad scope type of work as he's going to present today, where you, you take more of an overview, but you don't whitewash it, you apply good science to it, which is what I'd look for in this process. So, welcome, Grant, and show some good time. Thank you. I introduced myself at the Common Union Conference in, in Cape Town recently and it didn't go down very well. I just started talking about my baby and I thought that probably isn't the best way to introduce yourself to. I got an eight month old at home, so it's very exciting for me at the moment, so that's my life. Um, I get very excited about that, but not everyone does. So <laughs> <laughs> that's probably what I want to talk about if I introduce myself. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, so, I, I put up this title as a kind of, I really wanted to talk through all this stuff. It's, it's um, all interests me, especially from the HPGR point of view. I'm fascinated by the fact that HPGR, there's so many trade-off studies and so much work that's been done on it. And everyone says, everyone knows the energy efficiency benefits of HPGR. Um, but it, it seems that not everyone does. And I've, I've been kind of wondering why that is the case whether it's the science isn't in, or whether there's other aspects to it. Um, and when I start digging deeper into each one of these different things, I find that there's a myriad of different um, points of view and, and different opinions about it. So I'm going to kind of go through some of them. Um, obviously, one thing that Marco said yesterday, are you going to cover all of that? It seems like it's over an hour that you need to, dis to discuss all of that. And I, I'm not going to discuss all of it in detail. I'm probably going to focus on the top two um, and then introduce the bottom two, the, the conveying power and all hardness towards the end, because that's a direction that I want to go. Um, but the actual research that I've done has been around the bond work index and micro cracking. So um, I'll, I'll get stuck into it. It's going to be a bit of a different presentation. I actually presented something very similar at UCT um, in, what, three weeks ago now. And what was interesting is I had about 55 slides um, for an hour presentation because I was excited about all this technical detail. And the night before, I, I met with someone and I, I talked with an artist and there was all this stuff going on. And I realized I did not need 55, present, 55 slides to present this. So that night, um, until about 2 a.m., I, I cut down my slides to half. Um, or more than half, and so so the beginning of this is 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 what was 
presented there. So originally I had, um, <coughs> I, I like starting off my presentations with a context slide. And originally I had this complex content, context slide where I look at the industry context and I look at the cash costs and the price um, that is spent to get that material out of the ground and the mining productivity and the interplay between different metals. And it's a really interesting discussion and I, and I left everyone saying, well, we either retrench or innovate to be able to get out of the hole that we're in. But, I mean, that's not why I'm doing the work. That's not why I'm, I, I, I think that this is so important. Um, it's partially why, but um, it's only, a, a, only a, a partial work. This is why I'm doing a lot of work at the moment. I, I, may have been, I may have been motivated motivated by that in past years, but now I'm motivated by this. Um, this is my little girl. Um, she's in front of the Grand Canyon in the background now. It's, it's pretty obvious that she's, she's sitting around the edge of the Grand Canyon. She doesn't care about the Grand Canyon at all. We took her there and, and thought that she, she'd enjoy traveling around. What she actually is smiling about is those pieces of alfoil in front of her. <laughs> she loved these pieces of alfoil at the, at the Grand Canyon. And it got me thinking about the future, as babies do, um, the future of the world, the future of economies and stuff like that. And the fact that she was playing with the alfoil was really poignant to me in the mining industry. And I started thinking about the, the future of metals and, and how people fit in with that. And another thing that, that um, got me was, this is actually a photo um, by my cousin, uh, Tom Pierce. Um, he's in South Africa. He's done quite a lot of um, recognition for the, this, this photo series that he did. And the reason there's only two people in this photo is because um, the father had died. The father was, was killed by the mining industry. The father died from, um, from silicosis in South Africa. Um, and it got me starting to think, what, what, what is the impact of the mining industry on people, um, both as a negative point of view, from a safety, from an um, environmental, from a social point of view, um, and also from a positive point of view, with cars and with buildings and with everything um, that is around you at the moment. What would you look like if you weren't wearing anything that was, was influenced by mining? Even, even agriculture requires ammonium nitrate to, to be able to um, plant the thing. So uh, what, what, what this also said is that um, the role that art has um, in research I think there's a really good um, position for art in, in research in, in describing these complex problems in an emotive, beautiful way that brings out different feelings that you wouldn't necessarily get from a highly technical presentation that I'm about to give. So I just thought I'd start with that um, and, and before I moved into the technical stuff. Um, just to give a bit of a, a flavour of, of um, where my motivation comes from nowadays. So, um, now getting into the more technical stuff, um, one thing I've been working on recently, and this is just a background of how I've gone to HPGRs, one thing I've been working on recently is these energy curves. And Malcolm um, kind of hinted on this, that, that this is my research, and I, I've, I've presented it at a Friday seminar before, so I'm not going to go into big detail. Um, but essentially, what it is, is um, an ability to be able to show the <coughs> variability and comminution energy in a, um, in a way that, that can motivate energy reduction and energy efficiency increases. Um, so, so the idea is to present um, each mine as a bar um, in this, in this, this is a simplistic form, but each mine is a bar. The width of the bar representing the portion of um, annual production, and the height of the bar representing the energy intensity. So the same as a cost curve, but instead of the height of the bar um, representing the cost per ton um, of, of final product, it's, it's the kilowatt hours per ton, or um, uh, the kilowatt hours per ounce final product. Um, so that's, that's, that's how it looks. And, it, and it's come over a, a big period of time. Malcolm started the process. He, he kind of, and this is what I feel like for my whole career so far, 
it's been following behind Malcolm and picking up the crumbs that he hasn't had the time to, to, to look at. Um, and I've gotten really excited about it. So, so this came from Malcolm saying, well, why don't we... There's, there's all these different figures around how much energy combination uses on a mine site. So there's, there's all kinds of... Anyone that's looked into it will know about the Department of Energy um, stuff. There's, there's, there's hundreds of different figures and everyone seems to, seems to quote a different amount of energy that's, um, that's used by combination. So Malcolm said, well, we've got a whole lot of data why can't we do, like what South Africa does in um, the census, they, they count a number of people and then they extrapolate to the whole population because they can't actually get the whole population. So the idea was to get real detail on um, a portion of the mines and then be able to extrapolate it to, to the whole mining industry. Now that worked to an extent, um, but what I realised was that presenting it as a percentage of the mine site's energy that's used in comminution was really um, incorrect because the, a large proportion of that energy is used by other processes, not comminution. So actually, the proportion of comminution energy on a mine isn't necessarily due to um, a large amount of energy being used in the comminution process, but even less energy in that other 60% um, or so. So what I found was that we, we could do it, um, but the, the answer was something around 36%, um, and there was 36% of a mine size energy was used in combination, but there was a large variance across the, the database. So I kind of went, well, how can I display that variance in a, in a useful form without um, giving away what each one of the mines are? And that's where this energy curve process came from. And then um, C picked it up, um, the Coalition for Eco-Efficient Combination, um, and we, we've really had a really good adventure over the past two years on, on trying to increase the database. The database of, for, for the energy curves now includes 56% of the world's copper, 26% um, of the world's gold, um, and a large proportion of the lead, zinc, silver, platinum, iron ore, um, and it's continually growing. So, um, quite, a, quite a large database. Um, quite good, good data, so um, I'm, I'm quite proud of that and there's a lot of people in the industry that are getting excited about it and, and um, coming alongside and contributing their own data to, to be able to further this. Um, so that's just the background. But what I was looking for were case studies of where um, energy intensity has been reduced. And one of these case studies was done by um, Wang. He, he won the 2013 um, SEEK Award for the, for the best paper of that year in, in energy efficiency. And what, what he looked into was um, replacing, it was a, a trade-off study between um, SABC and HPGR, but it wasn't an ordinary trade-off study. He also looked at going from HPGR through, straight through feeding into an isomel. Um, which has been a trend recently. There's this trend to go from HPGR straight through to a disturbed mill, um, trying to keep the benefits of, of um, confined breakage going down the circuit. So what, what he found um, was that there, if you see up here, there was an energy reduction, um, both if you went from SABC circuits, so SAG and ball mill circuits, to an HPGR, you got about a 20% HPGR ball, you got about a 20% reduction in energy. Um, and if you went to an HPGR stirred mill, you got about a 35% reduction in energy. But there was also the interplay here of increased capex. Um, this, this, the reduced energy led to reduced opex, but um, the increased capex changed the picture of the MPV. So um, I, I found this a really interesting thing and I thought, well, Yes, there's the capex, but how can I display the energy um, improvements more effectively? So I put those into the, the energy curve. This is one of the energy curves. I, I produce four of them. Um, this is the size specific energy curve. So the kilowatt hours to produce a new ton of minus 75 micron. Um, and you can see here the ball mill, um, the HPGR ball mill moved down the curve. Um, but the HPGR stirred mill had a, had a much larger move down the curve, um, as you would have seen from the, from the previous data. 
And, and that was good. Um, we had a case study that we could show the benefits of, of in terms of energy um, on, on the energy curve. And, and that was really good. But I got some, some, had some really substantial discussions after producing this. Um, and they were around what is the actual energy savings on, on, for HPGR on a mine site. And um, there's been so many different trade-off studies. These are all the trade-off studies um, that were identified um, last year in a SAG paper. Um, and you can see here the, the energy savings for, H, for the HPGR circuit is somewhere between 11 and 33% for, for every single one of these case studies. Um, now I'm going to do something a little bit different for a Friday seminar, and I'm going to ask you guys the question um, before you get a chance to ask me the question. So um, my question to the audience, because I'd really there's, there's some experts in here that know a lot about this, um, I'd really like to find out why you think that there's so many trade-off studies um, in HPGRs that show energy improvements, um, but there are many fewer operating HPGR circuits, and, and only two of these on the list that I can work out actually um, went ahead and built those plants. So I'll, I'll get you to talk to maybe the person next to you, um, and I'll give you 30 seconds um, to discuss what you think is the, um, is the reason for this, and then I'll bring you back to the group, um, and I'll call on a couple of people. So, 30 seconds to talk to the person next to you. Why you think HPGR is Cerro Verde one, 
I'm not sure who was involved in that, but that went ahead in the, as yep. HBGR. So, and that was back in 2006. So you'd think there'd be a lot of experience there that engineering companies would be wanting to get hold of to say whether this is a good idea to their clients or not, but it hasn't happened. Yeah, it's good. Any other? I mean, you put up your hand. You want to? No, 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 no. Any, any other? Any other points? I think that you're trying to replace what's a very simple and elegant solution at SABC with something that's a lot more complex and that's going to lead back to being scared and afraid of moving to something that mm -hmm. you know, if, you, if you're installing a lot of conveyors to a metallurgist who's used to moving fluids around, that's going to be scary. There's, yeah. a, there's a great slide that um, Joe Pease puts up around the, and this would, this would hit you very hard, but um, the pre-concentration circuit at um, at Nanizer and the number of elements that are involved there between the, the, lead zinc, the lead zinc circuit and the copper circuit it's like 20 times as many pieces of kit so, around the place that requires maintenance, requires more staff and, and all those if, kinds of things so if you're the mill manager and your biggest problem is getting good staff mm -hmm. and you need good staff, more good staff to run a more complex plant yeah. you're not going to go for it very true. So, so that's 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 a that's a great that's a great point. One of the things that, that isn't understood there is is the response to variability of the orb. Um, so there's, and I'm not going to go into this in detail in this presentation, but the difference between SABC circuits and HPGR circuits in responding to the variability of, in competence of an orb. Um, there, there was a great paper at, at the SAG conference talking about a pre-crush SAG circuit. The, the effect of that on the operators, as soon as you put in the pre-crush circuit, the SAG mill didn't require as much um, attention and the anxiety of the operators reduced dramatically for a pre-crush circuit. Something that I hadn't really thought about as, as an outcome for a pre-crush circuit, which is a really interesting interesting point. So, so thinking about the operators in the process and how, and how much pieces of equipment. Yeah, those are, those are all really good and, and really important. I'm going to go off on a different, a few more technical um, issues because those sounded like a lot of people issues as well. Um, there's some technical stuff in there, but there's a lot of there's a lot of people issues, which is which is fair enough. In all these kind of decisions, um, what we come down to in a lot of cases is the, the people issues. And I think if we can get through the technical issues and create a clearer picture, the people issues can start to be um, moved apart. So that's my personal view. So I was interested in this. Um, so I looked at a case study and I had some contact with Anglo Gold Ashanti um, and some funding from SEEK so I decided to combine the two and spend a bit of time looking at a, the case study of Tropicana Gold Mine and Gramolotti Gold Mine because really interesting one company they both did trade-off studies between HPGR and SAG milling um, and Tropicana built an HPGR ball milling circuit <coughs> and Gramolotti is going to build an SABC circuit. Um, and I, I was fascinated by that because I wanted to know within one company um, what, what the, what the um, realities were there. Is it a different ore type? Is it, is, it, is it a different region? Is it different people making the decisions? Um, and actually what was interesting was that yes, it, it was probably a little bit of of those, but there was there was a, another issue altogether that came into it. Um, but once again, it comes back to people issues, which is which is interesting. So if we look at uh, look at trade offs, I've, I've talked a little bit about this. I'm way behind schedule because I've been talking too much. Sorry. About that. Um, so we've got HPGR circuit. So this is the standard HPGR circuit with second secondary crushing um, and a and a ball mill. And when you look at Tropicana. This is the um, feasibility study that was done at Tropicana, um, looking at the amount of conveying power, everything. Um, we would take about 22.5 kilowatt hours per tonne to, to go with an HPGR ball milling circuit. The SABC circuit, um, once again, standard SABC circuit with a recycled crusher. Um, these are the, the kind of powers that were required, um, specific power for, for that circuit, about 30 kilowatt hours per tonne. Um, and the, the, they also did a trade off on, on a three stage crush ball milling circuit. Um, and what was interesting there is that it came out um, effectively in between. Even though crushing used less power, um, it pushed more power through to the ball mill. 
because um, it had a sharp size distribution. Um, so yeah, interesting, interesting study. Um, and they did this for Gramolotti and, and Tropicana. So looking on specific energy using using the energy curve, you can see the difference here between the SABC circuit, the crushing circuit, and the HPGR circuit. So um, that was that was Tropicana. And Gramolotti had a similar distribution. Once again, HPGR was was um, improved over over SABC and to a similar extent, if not even more. Um, the reason that the Gramolotti is further down the, the curve is because it's to a coarser grind size, um, which is which is important to know. But essentially what this says is that the ore type doesn't seem to be changing the benefits or or or, or what of um, of HPGR over SABC. So it wasn't the ore type that was that was causing this. So what, what I found interesting was that it, you, can, you can present this on a kilowatt hours per tonne basis or you can present this on a dollars per tonne um, of, of combination energy dollars per tonne. Um, and the, the graph looks very different. When you take each one of those mines and you put in the actual electricity cost of those mines, there's a distribution internationally. Um, even domestically, there's there's a distribution of energy costs paid by different different companies, um, and so the, the variability across this becomes much greater. There's a bigger difference between right up the top and right down the bottom um, than there was in the kilowatt hour per ton basis. Um, and if you put Tropicana on there, you can see um, Tropicana still sat it sits at a similar position as it did. So this is the HPGR SABC crushing. But when you put Gramolotti on there, um, you see that the benefit of, of um, the, the kilowatt hour per ton reduction disappears, absolutely disappears, because Gramolotti is paying one third the amount for their energy um, than, than Tropicana. So if you put these both on top of each other as, as a shadow graph, you can see that the, although the technical benefits, the kilowatt hours per ton had reduced, the actual benefits in terms of dollars per ton um, became negligible. There was an addition to this, so this is one, one reason why uh, Gramolotti went for the um, SABC circuit. Pretty, pretty um, good reason, but the other one was they did a risk, a risk profile um, and there was a lot of um, qualitative um, assessment of the, of the different of the different circuits, so around around um, the impact of, of dust and, and and various different various different qualitative assessments, and from those qualitative assessments, have found that the SABC circuit had more had less risk um, in terms of energy and in terms of everything. So. I, I was interested in that, but, but what I also wanted to look at, now Tropicana starts operating, right? Um, and, and one of the issues that you find with the trailer study, no one said it here, but is that actually the energy benefit you're going to get? Um, all those trailer studies were done at a, in a design phase. Um, how well can we actually know how much an HPGR circuit is going to consume? Um, how confident are we that our designs are actually correct and that that energy benefit is going to be real? Um, and what, so, so I, went, I went, oh well, now I've got the data for the laboratory test that we done on Tropicana. Um, I've got the data for the design of the actual circuit and I've got the data for how that circuit was operating. We've got a, we've got a um, survey that was done there. So I, I decided to map these on the, on the energy curve once again. Um, we're back to the size-specific energy curve, so the kilowatt hours per tub minus 75 micron. And you can see this is where the HP, the laboratory test was done. Um, it was locked cycle, which is good. Um, we're recycling the more competent components and getting a, an idea about um, how the competent, the more competent component might might act in the in the circuit. It was a 500 millimeter um, HPGR, so quite a quite a large HPGR. And this is where it's at on the energy curve. Um, if we add to that the circuit design, 
What I found interesting was that they, they didn't use kilowatt hours per ton minus 75 micron in the, in the circuit design. But actually, if you looked, this is the whole circuit, not just the HP gel, the whole circuit. Um, that, that's where it's at. It's at right on what the laboratory test was, was showing, which I thought was quite cool. Um, I had seen, seen that actually occur, and that's what should occur, of course, but um, very, very different different HPGRs, different screen sizes, everything was, was different, but it sat at the same, same spot. Maybe that's telling us something, maybe it's not. Um, and this was where the survey sat. Um, so when the HPGR was surveyed, um, it sat there. And what was interesting, you, you always worry about doing a survey and comparing that to a design, because the all types almost always different. What I loved in this was the all type is very, very similar. Um, the, if you look at the fourth column along there, if you take into account the crushing work index, the rod work index, and the wall work index, you get a standard work index. There's almost no difference between what was the design um, bond and the, the survey. There's, there's a small difference in A times B, but not, not, not huge. Um, and they, they came out very similar. They came out on top of each other, which, which was quite good. What was interesting is that the ball mill did not. The ball mill, this is the, the first server of the ball mill, it came out at, at a much higher um, kilowatt hours per ton, so a much higher energy, um, much less efficient than the design was, was supposed to. And, and the conclusion, the original conclusion of the, the people doing the survey, and they presented this at the SAG conference, which is what got this whole process started, was that the ball mill was not experiencing the kind of bond work index reduction that was expected in the laboratory. So in the laboratory, anyone that knows um, something about HPGR, there's been a lot of work done on the fact that HPGR produces tiny little cracks in the particle, which reduces the competence of those particles further down the circuit in the, in the ball mill. Um, and so what this result showed was, oh, Micro cracks don't, aren't actually occurring on, on site. They're only occurring in the laboratory. Um, you can't see these on site. Um, and that was what was presented at the SABC circuit, at, at, at the SAG conference, sorry. Um, but they, they prematurely did this because they did another survey <laughs> and they found out that the ball mill actually sat down here. Right? So um, everyone was talking about this at the, at the SAG conference. And METSO came out and they said, uh, we don't believe in micro cracks with their new HRC crushes. Um, and and um, WEA came out and said, we do believe in micro cracks. I was having all these conversations. And it's really interesting to see different HPGR um, companies disagreeing just because that was presented very quickly at the, at the SAG conference. Um, but what actually happened was it was premature, um, a premature result. And what was actually occurring here was inefficiencies in the ball mill. It wasn't necessarily that the HPGR was passing on something that was different from design. It was that this ball mill was running 83% critical, and this ball mill was running at 75% critical. Um, and there's some playoff on this specific mine. <coughs> They've got a slip energy reduction uh, and energy recovery system, um, an SER drive, and they're using to change the critical speed, and it was dumping a whole lot of energy, um, and it wasn't working efficiently. That, um, combined with trajectories and, and line of design and stuff, was meaning that, that mill was running inefficiently. So, really interesting piece of work, and I, I kind of got excited about that. And I wanted to see, well, if, if, this, if this created all this tension in this micro cracks and bond work index, what is, why is there tension there? Why do people believe different things? Um, so that's where, oh, so this is the improvement that was achieved just changing the um, speed. It still has to be validated, there's some issues around the actual um, surveys, but uh, anyway. So this got me excited about the reduction in bond work index due to HPGRs. Now, the bond work index is um, a laboratory <coughs> test, for those of you who don't know about it, where you use a um, small scale ball mill and you you um, put in material, and the specification for the test is that you put in minus 3.35 material that's been progressively crushed in crushing. 
So you, you crush and then you screen, and then you crush and then you screen, and crush and screen until everything's passing minus the 3.35 the, the millimeter screen. So that's, that's the definition of the, the test. The problem is, when you, when you come to an HPGR, is that there's this playoff um, and there's this confusion around whether lots of people are seeing this reduction in bond work index when you put the material through from the HPGR. Is that due to these small cracks, these micro cracks in the actual particle that are generated from the compression breakage? Or is that due to a different size distribution? Because what happens is if you've got staged crush, which is minus 3.35, this is the size distribution you get. Much sharper size distribution. Um, whereas if you put an HPGR and you do closed cycle, lock cycle tests on an HPGR over a 3.35 millimeter screen, that's the size distribution that you get for the same ore. Um, and with this increased bond comes a reduction in, in the bond work index um, that isn't fully um, tied up in the, in the calculations that are, that are done for, for bond. So, as far as I can tell, there are four methods to mitigate this. Um, there are, you, can, you can either reconstitute the, the feed size distribution from the HPGR, so screen it, and then put little components um, back together to get the crush size distribution. So get the exact same size distribution, force that size, the HPGR size distribution to be the same as the crush. And I found out that's what Weir does. Um, and, and that's, that's interesting. Um, Copern, however, do a laboratory, a, a larger scale bore milling test, and they, they look at the rates in the bore mill, um, and they account for it in that way um, by taking out the front. <coughs> I, I read another paper actually just yesterday that um, used, used simulation, so um, used population balance modeling to be able to account for the, the change in size distribution and they saw that the, the reduction in bond work index due to the different size distribution was about 14-15%. Um, and the fourth method I'm going to talk about today is by using that kilowatt hours per ton minus 75 micron that I, that I suggested. So then we can account for the amount of fines that are in the feed um, and the amount of fines that we get in the, in the product. So, um, what we found, so I'll, I'll go back, oh, sorry. Um, if, we, if we look at this, um, I, I was able to get a database from, from Weir um, of all their, their bond work index tests, where they've reconstituted the exact same size distribution. So I thought this would be a really good example of how you can um, see the increase in, in or decrease in bond work index without the shape of the size distribution actually coming into effect. Um, and, and that was good, but the, yeah, so, so this, is the, this is the reduction in bond work index that you see. So in, the, in, in Weir's database that goes back about 20 years, if you look at the crushing product bond work index and the HPGR product bond work index, you can see the, the HPGR product, the red line there is a parity between the two, and um, the HPGR product bond work index is smaller in the, in the majority of cases than the, than the crushing bond work index, which shows there is a reduction even when you um, reconstitute the exact same size distribution. What's interesting though is that everyone in the industry has been reporting this reduction as a percentage. So they'll say, my bond work index reduced by 10% or my bond work index reduced by 15%. Now, if, if you could actually show it as a percentage, surely this, this would flare out. So at higher bond work indexes, you're getting the same kind of percentage. What we do see here is that there's a pretty consistent reduction in terms of kilowatt hours per tonne. So I, I believe this shows um, that there's, we shouldn't be presenting reduction in bond work index as a, as a percentage of, of the original bond work index, but as a reduction in actual kilowatt hours per tonne. Um, in, in so, so 
And, and what we saw is the average in the database is about two kilowatt hours per tub um, as the reduction in, in bond work index. But what I wanted to do was, was to show you the, the size specific energy. The, the problem with that is to do the size specific energy, you have to work out how much energy is actually consumed by the ball mill. Um, and Bond had a whole lot of empirical relationships that, that he, he brought together. Um, and so I went through all them and used the Levin technique, anyone who knows about it. Um, and what I found out was that the Bond test actually the, the calculations that Bond put together, and I'm very well to, I, I could share this with anyone in the room um, after this, but I didn't put it in the presentation. It's a bit complex. But essentially, what Bond's calculation does is it says that the relationship between the, the, the lab scale mill and his pilot scale mill, um, the energy efficiency of the lab scale mill reduces dramatically at high Bond work index. So at, higher, at harder ores, your um, energy consumption of the laboratory mill is effectively much larger than the, than the pilot mill. Um, whereas at low bond work index, um, they're almost on a, on a parity, which, which, I found, which I found fascinating. Um, and I think it goes back to what, what Malcolm's been saying about the, the bond mill and its effectiveness for, for high competence. Because it's such a small mill, um, it's not able to, to capture, uh, to break those, those more, those more harder components, uh, harder ores um, effectively. But if we, if we take that to the side, um, we now know the kilowatts of, the, of the, um, the bond mill and we can work out the size specific energy. What was interesting um, is that I got the same result, which, which I like, um, because the, the feed size distribution, the, the reason I got the same results um, in terms of size specific energy was that the feed size distribution was reconstituted. So in this case, the feed actually was the same for the HPGR and the, and the bond. Um, the next step in this is to get some data from, from other companies, um, other HPGR um, companies that have, that have different um, that have different methodologies. They don't reconstitute the, the size distribution. Now, what Craig has just shown me is that there's different scale. Yes, there is different scale. Um, the, the, the scale of this is a lot, a lot wider. Um, that is due to the fact that the bond work index, the kilowatt hours per tonne, is to reduce to a P80 of 100 micron, whereas um, here we're looking at the generation of 75 micron. Um, so that accounts for the difference in the, in the scale from going from a P80 of, of 100 micron um, to, to reduction to 75 micron. And so what, what I wanted to look at was, was the difference between two. So if we look at the reduction in bond work index due to, uh, in bond work index and the reduction in size specific energy, you can see there's a nice linear relationship, but linear relationships are great. I like knowing what happens at the outlines. So what fascinated me was this one. Um, I sat there and I went, why is that, that point in that quadrant? It doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be in that quadrant. Um, so I went back and I investigated the data and I realized there were four plants, there were four tests that they didn't reconstitute the crushing of the HPGR size distribution. And that was one of them. And I went, great. Well, which ones are the other ones? And here they are circled. <laughs> so I was able to explain this, but the other one sat on the line. So I'm, I'm still trying to work out exactly what's going on here. Um, and that kind of ruined my hypothesis. Maybe there's another line here you could, uh, you could argue, but I'm, I'm unsure. So I, I need more data to be able to look into this, and that's what I'm, I'm going to do in the next, next little while. And this is just for your information, this is the reduction in in bond work index um, that you can see for due to HPGR. So this is the energy curve, the bond work index energy curve. And the crushing um, sits around 50%, which you'd expect because the, the rest of the bond work index are all done with crushing it. Um, and if you move to an HPGR, you should move down to about the 20th percentile in, um, on average, you'd move down about 30 percentile points um, on the curve. So, I said that I would talk not just about um, 
bond rope index, but about other things as well. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to go through these quickly. Fortunately, I took too much time at the beginning. But conveying power is one that has always interested me. Um, since, since Marco went to a couple of different sites and calculated the conveying power, Macalacuea and Acadia, um, those are the top two there, um, and found that the conveying power actually um, equated to the, approximately to the HPGR power. So essentially you had to double the HPGR power um, to get actually what happens when you have an HPGR circuit. Um, and, and the bottom one here was really interesting as well. This is Cerevoto 2. And at Cerevoto 2 they have 31 megawatts worth of conveying power, which is a lot. Uh, <laughs> so I, I've got the figures on the right hand side. I need, I need to get a bit more data around this, but for um, for Macalquaida, it's about 5.8 kilowatt hours per tonne of conveying power. Um, at Cerro Verde, it's about 2.4 kilowatt hours per tonne. Um, Tropicana is about 2.0 kilowatt hours per tonne. Um, and at Kaya, it's about equivalent to the HPGR um, power, but I need to get better figures on that before I report them. The other thing that's interesting for the conveyors, and, and this is something Tim raised, I think. Um, <laughs> Was that they're, they're, uh, it's harder to it's harder to um, to manage the the breakdowns and those kinds of things when you have a lot of pieces of equipment and conveyors. So this is um, something presented by Bovington and looking at the cumulative um, production losses for different um, different areas. The the biggest one here is the the crushed or stockpile low level. Um, they explained why that was the case in the, in the paper, that it was around um, mining production rates and stuff like that. What I found interesting was that four of these are conveyors. It's a conveyor there, conveyor there, conveyor there, conveyor there. Um, and when you add those all up together, it's about 1,000 kilotons um, in this year of production that were um, reduced due to conveyor issues. Um, so yes, conveyors do create more maintenance. Um, there's belts that, that break, there's um, idlers that need to be replaced, there's all kinds of issues that need to be dug off if they go over their, their power. Um, the, 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 so, interesting. Um, let's see if we can, we can overcome that. The other thing that's interesting with HP Jazz, and we didn't, no, one, no one mentioned this, but was, was stockpile position. It's something that I found fascinating when I went out to Tropicana, um, which is the next slide I should have put first. But at Tropicana, they have one stockpile. Um, they go straight from the stockpile in front of their, or oh, after their primary crusher, um, and then they have no stockpiles between the secondary crushers, the HPGRs, and the ball mills, which is quite different. Um, you, you have to deal with it in, in terms of deferred stockpiles, so they, they kind of or offline stockpiles, they kind of feed material off um, at different points in time and create different stockpiles off to the side. But it dramatically reduces your capex for, for the mine um, when, you, when you reduce the amount of stockpiles. Um, normally, on an on a, um, HPGR circuit, and I say normally, there aren't that many, but um, the Boddington's and the and Michael the, um, and the Cerro Verdes of the world have a stockpile after the primary crusher, after the secondary crusher, and after the, the HPGR. So the stockpiles all large bins, um, they, have, they have a lot of storage around that circuit. This is an interesting paper um, done by Glacia Rosario. Um, he presented it at the SAG conference and at the competition conference recently. And what he said is that we can dramatically reduce the capex of these circuits if we move the stockpile to after the secondary crusher. There are some, there are some trade-offs here. You've got to produce, you've got to um, size a bigger secondary crusher, um, and you've got to be able to account for um, uh, lower availability. But um, the the trade-off there, when you put in the stockpile in this position, is is dramatic, which is which is pretty good. He, he was able to get the same capex as a SABC circuit, which which is which is interesting. Then you then you get on a similar playing field. And then energy has a bigger effect. And this is um, the only picture I, I could find. I went to Tropicana, but I didn't take very good pictures. I just had a GoPro. 
Um, it's not very good at taking pictures on site. Um, but this is sitting above the secondary crushes here, and you can see after the secondary crushes, this is the secondary crusher belt, that's the HPGRs over there, um, that's a transfer point, the HPGR screens are over here, um, that's the oversize coming back. There's no stockpiles there. Um, they're, all, they're all linked. Um, they're, they're, but there is an ability to take off the stockpile offline over here, and there's an ability to take off the stockpile up in that top corner. Um, so they've got kind of offline stockpiles, which is a really interesting design philosophy, I thought. Um, and the final thing I'll, I'll just briefly gloss over is um, the effect of all competence. Aidan Giblet um, has been banging on about this for a while now. It, when, when we present HPGR um, trade-offs and, and those kinds of things, we need to take into account all competence. And the reason for that is quite obvious at the top here. Um, this is a paper done by Anna Luxon um, that show when you have software, the actual benefit of HPGRs is nothing. It's negative. Um, NPV, in terms of NPV, a medium ore was also negative, but slightly less. Um, the NPV only became positive um, with, with the hard ore. So HPGRs, when you, when you trade off, um, HPGRs can potentially only become positive with more competent ores. Um, and that's because your SAG kilowatt output time increases dramatically at, at, at um, less competent, at more competent ores on the left hand side here. And you can see um, here, is, here is Bonington. And the reason they claimed that they went with HPGRs and HPGRs were effective for them was because they were highly competent ore and, and the SAG <coughs> power goes, goes up quite dramatically. So there's some next steps of the NGK. I'm going to not go through them because I don't have time, but I thought I'd acknowledge all the, all the people that have helped, and I'll put another picture of my baby up there, but um, and invite any questions um, from the audience.